Okay, so now we are moving to the 17th century, which if you remember our little look into the different methods of looking at Baptist church history, uh, this is the one that asserts that modern Baptists sprung out of Puritan soil and had separatist roots. So they really found their modern beginnings. We really found our modern beginnings uh, at the beginning of the 17th century. I'll sketch in a little bit of background and then we'll have a look at both those who are called the General Baptists and those who are called the Particular Baptists and then follow a few more specific things a little bit later on. So, um, back in the 16th century, in 1534, uh, the Church of England separated from the Communion of Rome. Uh, that wasn't a great theological decision. Uh, it was more the convenience of Henry VIII. Um, and in effect, religion was only minorly changed, apart from now Henry was the king and over the church in England, and the Pope continued as the Pope over the Roman Communion. But what happened there really set the stage for the next century and a half, at least. Of course, he was eventually succeeded by his daughter Elizabeth, Elizabeth I. Um, she was not what you would call a convinced heart belief Protestant. Uh, she advocated the middle way, as it was called. And in that situation of being out of Roman Catholicism into the church in England and a kind of half-baked Protestantism in some ways. Um, some were prepared, as we saw before, to take it gradually and to reform over time. Uh, others wanted to put their foot on the accelerator and really move as far and as fast as they could away from the medieval church and the pre-Reformation situation. Uh, there was a guy called Robert Brown, which is Brown with an E on the end, uh, his nickname was Trouble Church. They had good nicknames in those days. So this is Robert Trouble Church Brown. And uh, Robert Brown wrote a book called Reformation Without Tarrying for Any, without waiting for anybody. Uh, Reformation Without Waiting for Anybody, Tarrying for Any. And he wrote that in 1582. Uh, he came from an Anglican background. He was a thoroughgoing Presbyterian by this time. And he felt that further reformation needed to be done and it needed to be done now. We're not going to wait for the government or the king or the queen to get their act together. Uh, we need to change uh, and reform the scripture now. Uh, that group was sometimes called the hasty Puritans. Uh, the hasty Puritans because they wanted that reform but they wanted it now. Um, they felt in many ways that the situation of the English church much like the Roman Catholic Church before it was irretrievable. So they felt the church was not a, in a good space, in many ways not even a, a true church, so they must establish new churches and give themselves to that work. Uh, as time went on, the Reformation principle of sola scriptura, the scripture alone, became really the guiding principle of the English separatists, those who'd separated from the Church of England and that structure, who wanted to move forward and move faster, uh, they felt in many ways that what they were doing as separatists, which includes the, the Presbyterians in some measure, the Congregationalists and the Baptists, they felt they wanted to bring the Reformation work to its natural conclusion. In other words, we've, we've come in a good direction out of the medieval church background, but we want to keep going in that good direction and take it through to its natural conclusion. So while the first step in the Reformation had been fundamentally the recovery of biblical doctrine, and particularly the great truths of salvation having to do with justification by grace through faith, that had been established and set in place. And now the separatists were sort of adding to that uh, as the Anabaptists had attempted to do gathered churches of believers and these things were moving in that right direction. They wanted to continue that path and bring it to a conclusion. If indeed it ever gets to a conclusion, I don't think it does. We're always reforming, uh, as was a good Reformation motto. So the particular Baptists 
as well as the General Baptists, saw themselves as the logical outcome of the Reformation in Europe. Started well, now this, we're not changing from that, we're really fulfilling it and we're working it out in practice. Uh, so both what are called the General Baptists and the particular Baptist arose in this separatist, Puritan, dissenting background. They dissented from the conclusions and the situation of the church in England. They separated from that and both the general and particular Baptists independently arose in this separatist atmosphere. Uh, firstly and briefly, and we'll develop some of these things a bit later, but a man called John Smith, S-M-Y-T-H, uh, left the Church of England. Uh, he joined a separatist church in 1607. So you've got John Smith, now becomes part of a separatist church in 1607. Uh, he, along with, I haven't buried my marker, so this is John Smith, and we're in the realm eventually of what's called the, the General Baptists. And he links up with a guy called Thomas Helwis and others, but they're two prominent names at this time. So they're trying to think through what the church should be and uh, think through some of these implications of what they're believing. Um, so with Thomas Helwis, uh, Smith and others met at a manor house in Gainsborough and they tried to practice what they thought a gathered church should look like. Um, by, sorry, after about a year things were difficult because of the opposition of the established Church of England so the group actually moved to Amsterdam. This happened a lot in those days. So they were there in Gloucestershire, I think it was, in Gainsborough. And then they think, well, things are getting hot here. It's hard to practice our convictions. Hop across the channel, uh, go to Holland, go to Amsterdam and set up and practice our faith there. Uh, by 1609, uh, this group affirmed believer-only church with believer's baptism. Okay? So this is some of the things we saw the Anabaptists were grappling with and practicing. At this point, down the track in the next century, uh, they're affirming believer-only church and believer's baptism, but they're not immersing. So baptism for them at this point was not immersion. Do you know how they baptized? Effusion, which is pouring water or face washing. They also did that. So the Baptist, baptismal practice for believers was the pouring of water or even the washing of the face. And so this is believers' baptism as John Smith, Helwes and others are trying to work this through. Uh, the way they did it at first was, again, there are no Baptists around, so what do we do? Uh, Smith's ingenious conclusion was, I will baptise myself. So uh, he poured water upon himself in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit and baptised himself. I mean, which sounds funny, but you know, what do you do? Um, well, there's probably better solutions, but this is what he did. He baptised himself and then he baptised uh, Helwes and then they baptised others. Meanwhile, this group is continuing to study the scriptures. Uh, they're seeking to conform their practice as a church to what they find in the New Testament. Um, they, they believe the Church of England is beyond reform, even though they are people and the majority of people, the consensus of people in the Church of England at this point, are reformed in their convictions, in their theological convictions. Uh, but they're trying to go down into the area of church practice. Um, Smith while over in Holland, sadly departed from his Calvinistic convictions. So he'd had that kind of background, which was common in the Church of England and common amongst the separatists. But in Holland, he was influenced away from that and he embraced uh, Arminianism. So this is why 
This is General Baptist, okay? General Baptist is the Baptist that affirm Arminianism and particularly a general atonement, okay? And so this is the realm theologically in which they're going. Uh, Smith goes from his reformed understanding and which was a hot issue at this time in Holland and he comes to that position. And then Smith finally moves further away from his um, background and he joins, this is only Smith and a few friends, the Dutch Mennonites. Remember Menno Simons? The Anabaptists, these are people who are from that grouping. So they're practicing believers baptism and the only ones he sees are really doing this are the Mennonites in Holland. So Smith goes and attaches himself to them. These are the beginnings of the General Baptists. Um, he particularly did that because he had regrets over his self-baptism, whether that was really a valid thing to do. So he wanted to join himself to an established group, and that's what he did with the, the Dutch Mennonites. Um, can I just ask a question? You can. That? Does that mean he got rebaptized by the Mennonites, what you just said there? I think he did, but I can't remember precisely. Yeah. Um, Helwes, his friend, uh, said that there was no need for regret, even though self-baptism may not be the way we should go generally. He thought in those circumstances there, there was no need to regret that. And Helwes pointed to the example of who in Scripture baptized others but was never baptized himself. Sorry? Where's that answer from earlier today? John the Baptist. <laughs> okay, so John the Baptist, he said, here's an example of someone who baptized others, but as far as we know, according to scripture record, he was sent to do that, but he, he was never baptized by somebody else himself. So that's what Helwes' argument was. You don't need to have done this step and joined this group uh, under the extraordinary circumstances that was okay what you did. Um, with the remainder of their group in Holland, uh, Helwes returned to England in 1612 and he said, now we want to go back home to England and we want to testify to our convictions about the nature of the church and the nature of, bap of baptism in our own country. Uh, sadly, Helwes was sent to Newgate Prison because of his aberrant views that weren't in line with the prevailing views of the Church of England and he died soon after in prison in 1616. So that's a little bit, we'll come back to them at other points, but that's a little bit of the beginnings of the General Baptists. Um, here are some of the important doctrines and practices back there in the 17th century of the General Baptists, okay? So here is a little sketch of some of the things that were important to them. Doctrines and practice. Number one, they had a connectional view of the church. Which means while they affirmed the autonomy in some senses of the local church, they also put in a structure above the local churches, which in their case was a general council. So the general Baptists have a general council uh, which is a way of coordinating their work and the autonomy was given up in part to that general council. They also, secondly, um, emphasized what they saw as the six principles that identify a church from Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Could someone read Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 for us, please? So they're, they're seeing in this verse six principles of identifying a true church. Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Therefore, Thank you. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the evolutionary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, but the doctrine of baptisms, Laying on the of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Okay. So 
than how your exegesis is going at this point, but they saw in that verse, or those two verses, six principles that identify a church. Number one, repentant, repentance. Number two, faith. So I so said, there's the gospel. Now, I'm not agreeing with this exegesis. I'm just saying this is what they were, they were doing. Um, repentance and faith. First two principles that identify a true church. Number three in that little list in those verses is baptism. So a true church has the gospel, repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, baptism. Of course, baptism of believers on profession of faith. Number four uh, mark of a true church was the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands. The laying on of hands has, means different things to different people and is practiced in different ways by different groups. What they meant by laying on of hands was your faith and your baptism were confirmed by the minister of the church. So the church pastor would lay his hands on the new member and pray for them. So you've got repentance, faith, baptism, the laying on of hands by which the minister of the church that you're now joining is sort of signifying um, and praying for you as a new member and part of that church. Principle number five they saw as far as the identity, identity of the church is the resurrection of the dead. I guess is a, a faith element of what we believe and look forward to. Number six was eternal judgment. So they took the six elements of those two verses and said that identifies a church. So this was a common belief and perspective among the general Baptists at that point. Um, many more people around these early times moved from these general Baptist churches into the particular Baptist churches. And some of those people moving from general to particular um, brought with them the practice of the laying on of hands. Is the laying on of hands in the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith? No. But when you get to America and when you set up what was called the Philadelphia Confession, which is largely the Baptist Confession of 1689 with a few additions, and one of those additions was the laying on of hands. So in the Philadelphia Confession, down the track in the 1700s, uh, a man called Elias Keach, who was the son of Benjamin Keach, the famous Baptist we'll have a bit of a look at. Uh, his son went to America. His son's really interesting. Uh, Elias went to America and he was not a believer, but he thought he wanted to make some money. So he thought, my dad preaches, I'll preach and I'll sort of uh, provide for myself in America. So he was out preaching in churches in America and was converted by his own sermon. Uh, so Elias Keach, uh, that's his background, and became very influential in planting various churches after that. But conversion is, is first, usually here. Um, and he's the one responsible for taking the general practice, practice of laying on of hands into the particular Baptist stream in America at least. Um, so we've had connectional view of churches. So you've got churches, but you've also got a general council. You've got the six principles from Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. Thirdly, as an important doctrine in the general Baptists, you have the practice of ministers being in one church for life. Okay? Ministers being in one church for life. Uh, they viewed the relationship of pastors and churches like marriage okay so if you went and became the pastor of a church you were covenanting yourself to that group of people and you were there for life that was the ideal and that's what they aimed at and that's what they saw was the the right thing to do number four kind of doctrinal practice of the general baptist uh, here we go English language test. Endogamy, anybody? Endogamy. 
How about monogamy? Sorry? You've got this one, yes. Yeah. Monogamy is one man, oh well, <laughs> one man, one woman. Uh, marriage, so polygamy is married to multiple partners. Here is endogamy, which has the sense of you could only marry within the group. Okay, so that was another general Baptist practice. Uh, and there was, get this, automatic excommunication if you married outside your group or your church. Automatic excommunication if you married outside the group. Um, <laughs> You, you'll see why people move to the particular Baptist. No. <laughs> um, number five and last of these doctrines of the general Baptists, no congregational singing. No congregational singing. <laughs> Only one person could sing. So you could have singing in church, but only one person could sing. And the practice was against um, congregational singing, which we will also see, not in the same way, but in particular Baptist churches, they had the 17th century equivalent of the worship wars in the hymn singing controversy of the 1690s. That's not this one, but this is a live issue. Remember that really the singing of hymns by the congregation was recovered in the Reformation. And you, there's accounts of people like John Knox uh, going to reform churches on the continent and they've, they've never heard congregations singing before and as they're listening to con congregations singing the praise of God tears are streaming down their faces because it's the most wonderful thing you could ever be a part of hearing these believing people together singing the praises of God so that, that had occurred in the Reformation but there's some challenges to that kind of practice as to all practices by this time General Baptists uh, by the end of the 17th century, by the 1690s, uh, they're in real trouble. They're in serious decline. Well, maybe for the reason we may just identified, I don't know. They're in serious <laughs> decline. Um, uh, they used, yeah, sorry. They, in some ways, historically, they are viewed as more important than the particular Baptists because they came a little bit before them. But the particular Baptist certainly became more prominent and more widespread uh, after these early days. Uh, both the general and particular Baptists recognized one another's baptisms. They recognized one another as Christian churches. Okay, so the general said, yes, you are brethren of ours to the particular Baptists, and they reciprocated. Uh, but there was a, a growing Arminianism in the culture and also a growing anti Calvinism as aspects of the 17th century went on. So that's a, a quick introduction to some of the bat background of the General Baptists. Okay, particular Baptists. Developing it around the same time, a little bit later, but around the same time, people are grappling with the same issues. How do we do church? What is a true church? Uh, what, how should we practice baptism, etc. Um, Charles I appointed a man, this is where the boos and the hisses come in, called William Lord as the Archbishop of Canterbury. And William Lord was committed to a very aggressive Arminianism. And William Lord sought to make in England a Calvinistic interpretation of the 39 Articles. You know the 39 Articles, which are the doctrinal statement or confession of the Anglicans? 39 Articles. Archbishop Lord, of course, of the Anglican Church, sought to make a Calvinistic interpretation of the 39 Articles illegal. Okay? Now, if you know the 39 Articles, they have a lot of reformed elements in the 39 Articles. But Lord is trying to push that out, squash that down, and promote an aggressive kind of Arminianism. Um, at the heart of what he's doing was also a, an emphasis on infant baptism. And from the 1630s, there began another 
campaign of persecutions against people who were dissenters, people who were separatists from the Anglican Church, and that resulted in what was called the Great Migration of Puritans or separatists to two places, one being Holland, as we saw with the General Baptists, the other place being New England in America. Okay, so there's this, you know, the Pilgrim Fathers, okay, and those early uh, boats, what was it? Uh, Mayflower, thank you. I almost said Columbus's boats for a moment there, my mind was going crazy. Um, so on the Mayflower and others, the Speedwell was another one of those, they went across to America. So these Pilgrim Fathers, uh, a lot of them are separatists, dissenters from the Church of England wanting religious freedom and going either to Holland where they had measures of freedom or to make a fresh start in America, uh, particularly in the New England area. In the midst of this situation, um, there came a church that was established which is known historically as the JLJ Church wasn't known like that at the time, but it's the JLJ Church, which is called after the first three pastors of the church, the first initials of their surnames. So you've got Henry Jacob, you've got, what's his first name? Lathrop. Uh, John Lathrop, should have guessed John, that's almost always the right answer in the Reformation and the Puritan <laughs> period. Uh, and you've got Henry Jesse. So this is a separatist congregation uh, known historically, if you see them in books, as the JLJ Church. They're actually a, a semi-separatist congregation. They're semi-separatists because unlike a lot of separatist churches, they still acknowledge the, the churches of the Church of England as true churches. Okay, some of the separatists just wanted to wipe their hands of the Anglican churches, but they said, no, there are believing churches within the Anglican denomination, the Anglican group, and they were a semi-separatist church in that sense. Um, Henry Jacob was the first pastor of this church in 1616. The problem was, in those days, in order to be a legal subject of the crown, you had to be baptised in the Church of England. See how hard that is, is just trying to work out these biblical principles. You're really bound into the system of the government of the country. To be a legal subject of the crown in England, you had to be baptised in the Church of England, uh, within the parish system where your name was recorded for births, etc., uh, in that system. So, as these groups were trying to figure their way through this and develop independent congregations on biblical grounds. They were often still taking their children off to be baptised in the local parish church, otherwise they wouldn't be recognised uh, by, by the nation. So they're struggling with all these practical issues. So Henry Jacob pastors this church from 1616. 19 years later, John Lathrop becomes the pastor, 1635. Maybe I should just say at this point, the history of this church is complicated. I won't go into all the details, okay? But there are effective splits of this church off into different groups as people are grappling with different convictions as they're trying to work out the, the idea of baptism and how it should be practiced. But, so there was a, a split after Lathrop was the pastor in 1638 and a new church came out of that split in 1638 which practiced believers' baptism. So this is not this semi-separatist congregation, this is an offshoot, and they practiced it by immersion. This is the church, we mentioned the name before, I think the last hour, pastored by John Spilsbury. So now you have a separatist congregation practicing believers' baptism and practicing that not by pouring or face washing, but by the immersion of people. Uh, Lathrop actually headed off for America 
around this time. The new pastor, the final pastor of this church in its early days was Henry Jesse. But in the midst of all this, this church is important because it gave birth to this church, which is effectively the beginnings of the particular Baptist work. In the you know, don't die on all these details, please. Uh, uh, but it's just trying to show you what was happening. You're in a constant state of flux and turmoil as you're trying to work out what does the scripture teach and how can we best practice what we believe the scripture teaches. And so this is all going on at this time. 1640s, this church continues to think about baptism. Um, they held conferences every week for a year to try and figure out what baptism should be like. And they sent a guy, this was before they come to this final position, they sent a guy called Richard Blunt uh, off to Holland to, desert, to observe the Dutch Anabaptists to see how they practice the baptism of believers. So the whole environment again is scriptures are important, scriptures are the word of God, we soak ourselves in the scriptures and we figure out what we are to believe and practice from the word of God. This is happening here. Uh, so we're in the 1640s now, almost there to the beginning of this. In 1641, maybe into New Year of 1642. And if I remember rightly, they didn't have the New Year's at the beginning of January. It was some other time of the year in these days, around about March or April. But so somewhere on the border of 41 and 42, uh, we have, here we go, drum roll please, uh, we have the first linking of believers' baptism by immersion and reformed doctrine. That's how we get a particular Baptist church, particular in the sense of what? Partic yep. The atonement of Christ was a specific atonement, an effective atonement. It did secure a people. Christ atoned for their sins. It didn't just make atonement possible, but it secured that atonement and salvation. So you've got now particular Baptists coming with that rich heritage of Reformed doctrine through the Reformation, through the Puritans and Separatists, now gathering in believers' churches and now practicing baptism and now practicing baptism by immersion. Interesting. This winter here was the coldest period in the Western world in 1,000 years. Okay, coldest period as far as records go in the Western world in 1,000 years. It was called the Little Ice Age. Okay, so they started baptizing people by immersion in the Little Ice Age. Okay, so the, the coldest period for a thousand years. Um, this group eventually carved off from the group under J, JLJ, forming their own church. Um, the pastors being this Richard Blunt and his fellow elder, Samuel, I think, Blacklock. And how they did it this time was, instead of Spilsbury where he baptised himself, or so Smith where he baptised himself, you've got Blunt baptising Blacklock and Blacklock baptising Blunt. Okay, so uh, that's how they began that practice in the life of this particular church. Having, the elders having baptised one another, uh, they then baptised... 41 other people initially, another 12 people a bit, little bit later on, and um, that became the first particular Baptist church. If you followed that, you're doing really well. But I'm just trying to, you've got two streams coming at the same time, the General Baptists and now the particular Baptists. Um, I, he's not particularly a, a particular Baptist, <laughs> but I, I love the picture of Praise God Bare Bones. Um, I love the name. I almost entitled this series mischievously as what was it going to be? Praise God, Hercules and Christmas. Because they're all people in Baptist history. Praise God, Bare Bones, Hercules Collins and Christmas Evans. Okay? So we could have had Praise God, Hercules and Christmas, but I thought that would have confused you too much. Uh, Praise God, Bare Bones is a separatist minister in this kind of area. 
Okay. No one in the oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's okay. No, just having a joke. Yeah. He wasn't a particular Baptist, but he was a separatist pastor, and he said. He called the particular Baptists his loving acquaintances and friends. Okay, so he was, he was an important person, a significant pastor, uh, but he wasn't a particular Baptist, but he said, that was his real name. In those days, you gave people names like that. <laughs> the Puritans often gave that kind of name. Why would you name your son Hercules? Okay. Or why would you name your son, praise God, because you wanted him to praise God. <laughs> okay, so we're now still in the early seven, sorry, 1600s, and by the middle of the 1600s we now have General Baptists and we have Particular Baptists. How is our time going, Time, timekeeper? Ten minutes, thank you. Okay. Let me talk a little bit more about the particular Baptists. Important leaders, I'm not going to go into detail, but if you find this book, um, Kiffin, Nollies and Keach, the three K's, you've got JLJ and the three K's, sounds like a music group. <laughs> uh, Kiffin, Nollies and Keach, okay, William Kiffin, Hansard, Nollies and Benjamin Keach are three of the important early particular Baptist pastors. Also our friend, Austin Walker, father of Jeremy Walker, who I believe has taken a conference here, uh, wrote the excellent Mr. Keach, which is another great biography on Benjamin Keach. So these are some of the founding fathers, as it were, of particular Baptist churches. Um, let me talk about some of them. Uh, William Kiffin, born in 1616, lived to 1702. He was the acknowledged leader of the, I'll give you his name in case spellings. So Kiffin, and we'll have a look at Nollis and Keach. Don't confuse the three Ks with the JLJs. <laughs> yeah, or the KKK, yeah, for that matter. Yes, please. <laughs> Although that will also come into Baptist history a bit later. Um, the acknowledged leader of the particular Baptist cause, cause in London was William Kiffin. Uh, Kiffin was a, described as a fabulously wealthy merchant, okay? A man who had done very well. Um, a generous church in those days would pay a minister 80 pounds per annum. And uh, Keach was all about promoting, oh, sorry, Keach. Kiffin was all about promoting and providing for pastors and ministers. Uh, Kiffin was sometimes an alderman in the city of London. He was once asked by the King Charles for a loan of £40,000. Gives you an idea of the guy's wealth. Uh, but he said, no, but I'll gladly give you £10,000. Um, so this is the background of William Kiffin. Uh, Kiffin seems to have used his money really wisely and his connections even with the higher echelons of society well for the gospel. Uh, sadly, both of Kiffin's grandsons were executed at one point because they'd been, come up, they'd been caught up in a political movement, um, which was called the Fifth Monarchists, I think, uh, and they were trying to establish their own political agenda and the king had them executed. Uh, Kiffin's second wife, his first wife died, was disciplined by the church from stealing money from her husband, uh, which wasn't a good thing. Uh, Kiffin also entered into uh, a, a, I was going to say a friendly, but probably wasn't friendly, argument in paper, uh, in books with John Bunyan on baptism. Okay, John Bunyan we've put under the Baptist label, but some of these guys had a bit of a question over John Bunyan because of his open membership. Uh, practice in the church which they didn't agree with or some of them at those times so William Kiffin is one of the leaders here second one in these three K's is Hansard Nollis uh, he was ordained as a deacon in the Church of England became a priest in the Church of England resigned under Archbishop Lord's persecution 
fled to New England, returned from New England back to England, uh, became part of the JLJ Church. This is Hansard Knollis. And finally, in that church, as we've mentioned, with its complex history, uh, held a conference to, to figure out the practical issue of baptism. Uh, Knollis's wife had a baby, and he has questions over, should I baptize this child? So he holds a conference in the JLJ church, a get together to talk this out and to resolve it. Present uh, there to counsel that church was, praise God, bare bones. <laughs> Thomas Goodwin, Jeremiah Burroughs, some of these guys have works reprinted by the Banner of Truth, uh, Philip Nye and others. So they're all there to counsel the church how they should advise and help Hansard Knollis with this issue. Uh, conclusion of that conference was the church needed to allow for tender consciences over this matter. Um, Knollis later becomes the, these church names are good too, uh, becomes the pastor of the Broken Wharf Cripple Gate Church in London. Okay, the Broken Wharf, which was its location near the Cripple Gate in London. So he becomes the pastor of that church. And Knollis is a learned man. He writes lexicons in both Hebrew and Latin. Um, he's also one of the first signatories to the 1689 Confession of Faith. And out of respect for his age at the time of the 1689 Confession signing, uh, he was allowed to sign first. So he's the first pastor in signing off on that confession. Benjamin Keach deserves a lot of attention. He was born in 1640. He lived to 1704. He's part of a pastor of a church which nowadays would be call, called in the fashionable area of Horsley Down or Horsley Downs. But in Keach's day, he was pastor of a church at Horse Lie Down. <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> it was a very interesting place. Anyway, uh, so in the Horsley Down church, he became the pastor. Ke Keach wrote 43 books. And some of them are reprinted and valuable today. He won one, for instance, on the parables of the scriptures. He wrote run one on the types and metaphors of scripture. Uh, sometimes he appears to be, in his interaction with others, a bit of a troublemaker. Uh, he was a man who wrote in defense of hymn singing. Uh, typically in his practice they sang a hymn, one hymn, usually at the end of worship. Uh, Keach traveled a lot and aided needy pastors and urged churches to support their pastors well. Kiffin Nollis Keach, Hercules Collins, uh, died in 1702. He was pastor of the church in Wapping in London. Uh, he was imprisoned in the 1680s for his convictions. He wrote touching books from scripture from prison, including a tribute to a Seventh-day Baptist he was imprisoned with. So in these days you had the generals, the particulars, and you also had some Seventh-day Baptists. Okay, so affirming uh, the Sabbath day was not the Lord's day, but rather the Sa Saturday. So you had Seventh-day Baptists as well. And uh, Collins wrote a touching tribute to this man from prison, or he was in prison with. Uh, Seventh-day Baptists were largely particular Baptists in their in their convictions. Uh, Collins published a Baptist version of the Heidelberg Catechism called the Orthodox Catechism, which is still available these days, which included a section on the laying on of hands, as we mentioned before. And he also wrote a book called A Temple Repaired, A Temple Repaired, which was a book on preaching and hermeneutics, similar to William Perkins' book which again has been reprinted by Banner of Truth called The Art of Prophesying. So these guys are writing on the interpretation of scripture, how you handle parables, how you handle metaphors and types, uh, how you deal with these various aspects. Um, they're men engaging with scripture and trying to teach that to their
congregations. Time frame, one minute. Nehemiah Cox. Nehemiah Cox died in 1688. He was the son of a man called Benjamin Cox. He joined John Bunyan's Bedford Church as a young man in 1669. Uh, he was a signatory to a letter disciplining a member for frequenting the Church of England. So he was a church discipline matter because one of the members of the particular Baft or the, church, the Bedford Church at least was frequenting the Church of England. That was in, in 1671. Uh, Cox and six others were called to the work of the ministry in the Bedford Church. They were not the main pastor, but they came under the category which is mentioned in the Confession of Gifted Brothers. Okay, gifted brothers, men with some ability to preach, but weren't the, the main pastor of the church. Uh, let me see. So they were given a license to preach and the permission at the permission and discretion of the church. Uh, Cox was called to pastor a church in 1673, but the Bedford Church refused to release him because they were benefiting from his ministry. In 1674, he was censured for certain miscarriages. Uh, by the Bedford Church, maybe related to his views on baptism and membership, which were probably closed communion, closed membership views, unlike Bunyan's views. Uh, Cox supported himself as a cord waner. Go to Google and find out what that is. Uh, many of these men had to find other means to support themselves as they pastored and ministers, ministered in churches. Uh, Collins and Cox were ordained as pastors eventually in the Petit France Church, the Petit France Church, a district in London, and Cox also was a qualified physician. He wrote a 1684 book on arthritis. In 1677, there is the first known reference to our confession of faith in the Petit France Church Minute Book, where they say it was agreed that a confession of faith with the appendix thereto having been read and considered by the brethren should be published. That was of course Tony in 1677 and it was eventually published and released in 1689. So that implies the confession probably originated in the Petit France Church and Cox and Collins were the most likely candidates to be some of the editors of the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689. Finished. Almost. Uh, so we'll come back to this century. We're just given a rough background. General Baptists, particular Baptists, seven-day Baptists. We could also divide the particular Baptists into confessional and John Bunyan. Okay? Uh, confessional, Baptist churches, and also Bunyan's Bedford Church. Um, which was slightly different in its orientation. And then there were also some floating, they won't call this, floating Baptists who went between the Arminian and the particular Baptist churches. <laughs> okay, don't, please don't write that down in your notes as, as an official designation. Okay, come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.